Hello everyone and greetings to everybody and as people from different time zones have joined us therefore good morning good evening or good afternoon to everyone thank you for joining this webinar and thank you for immense support as uh, we got more than 6000 registrations for this webinar with dr stephen creshen so as uh, you all may know that first we uh, try to have this session this webinar on zoom but due to some difficulties and as the number of participants was very large we could not do it on zoom and we had to shift from zoom to youtube and i'm glad to see a lot of you people already joined in from yesterday and a lot of people commenting even before the webinar that they are excited for it or they are waiting for it so this means a lot to us and thank you for showing all of this support so uh, now as you know that this shifted from zoom to youtube so this webinar will be different from our previous webinars which means that this will be different in uh, uh, in only uh, in only one thing that would be that there would be no uh, live Q and A session in this webinar. However, when we sent out the registration forms, we already uh, gave a field in which you could ask your question. So the questions uh, uh, absolutely when the people who registered crossed 6,000. So also questions were around five to 6,000 as well. So uh, we cannot uh, include those all questions in our webinar. Therefore, we shortlisted a few of them, almost 10 to 11 and uh, with names, of course, and asked with different questions, those questions. So, and we also like uh, got a rough idea that uh, when uh, we are, the questions were being repetitive. So we like made one question out of them and also asked it from the Stephen question. So there aren't any live Q and A session, but the questions which you guys already asked in registration form are asked from the Stephen question. And if, when you will hear his talk, a lot of your questions will also be cleared from that because uh, I personally observed that a lot of questions which were already asked were had uh, were answered by Sir Stephen Creation even uh, when he was uh, just uh, giving his presentation. So yes, uh, that is how this session will be uh, different from it. And we, uh, I would like to inform you all that we already uh, recorded the session with Sir Stephen Creation as there is no live Q and A session. So I will be playing that recording, which I which have been recorded a few hours ago. And then we will come to the certificates uh, distribution process. And please keep and uh, like be online and be live till the end uh, because our certificate and distribution uh, process requires you to be online. So how you will be filling that form, those who have attended previous uh, sessions already know those who are new please uh watch the video till the end to know the process and if you haven't done registration so don't worry you are still uh, eligible to get the certificate all right so uh, that's all about it and now we will begin our uh, webinar with sir stephen thank you Okay. Hello, everybody. I'm Steve Krashen. You already knew that. And I want to begin today by telling you uh, an anecdote, what has happened to me, which I think presents all the important information that I want to share with you. Right now, as you know, we are all living in a pandemic. We are all staying home, uh, trying not to go out. And I've been doing that too. I want to tell you what I've been doing for the last more than a year. 
I've been in quarantine, okay? I'm home alone. I tell people I'm home alone with my girlfriend. Now, my girlfriend is my wife, and she's been married. We've been married for 55 years. So we're still having a very good time. Thank you. It's been very pleasant, the quarantine. I really like it. Let me tell you what I've been doing. I've been exercising. You can tell, right? We can strong. I have been drinking lots of coffee, which is very good. I've been doing my work. I've been playing the piano, not just practicing and also practicing the piano. That's been very good. And I've been working on my languages. Here's what I've been doing. Here's how I got the idea. Every Friday morning at the local supermarket, there's a special time when old people can go shopping, only old people like me. You have to be at least 65 years old. For me, that's still pretty young, but that's when I go shopping. And the first time I did that, I got my groceries, I stood in line, and the man who was helping me, who was you know, charging me at the cash register. Um, his name, I could see his name. His name is Fidel, which is a Mexican American name, a Spanish name. And I heard him speak Spanish. So of course I spoke Spanish to him. Now I have to tell you, Spanish <clears throat> is not my best language. It's like number four, okay? But I spoke Spanish to him. He answered me in English, which is what you're supposed to do with customers. You never know. I was ready. I said to him in Spanish, Fidel, you can help me. I said this in Spanish. Tu puedes ayudarme. My goal is to speak Spanish the way you do. I use the plural of the of the youth of the second person plural, ustedes, the way you Mexicans speak Spanish. I said, please let's speak Spanish. He loved it. He became my helper. I have been speaking Spanish to Fidel about once a week for the last year and a half. And we've become pretty good friends. We do a lot of gossip, okay? Somebody once said, if you don't have anything good to say about somebody, come sit next to me, <laughs> okay? So we've been gossiping about other people, telling stories. And I, I think I'm getting better because he speaks more quickly. He uses more complicated grammar and vocabulary. And now I've been occasionally speak Spanish with people I know. <clears throat> I have a lot of Mexican American friends. And one of them said, Steve, your Spanish is so much better. What are you doing? I'm not improving because of Fidel. We only talk for maybe a minute. He has work to do. He's working at the cash register. He has other customers, so it has to be short. When I go home, I've been reading. I've been reading lots and lots of very easy Spanish. These are called graded readers. Uh, most of you know about these in English. You know, the Longman series, the Newberry series. I've been doing them in Spanish, <clears throat> and I have found a couple of authors who are very good. The graded readers have improved a lot, and some of them are literature. They're good, good stories, okay? Um, Adriana Ramirez is my favorite author now. I've been in contact with her. Uh, I've read a couple. I'll tell you about one of her books. So you see how good this is, how good these things. A young man goes to Colombia. He's in Colombia in the major city, and he knows a little bit of Spanish. He had it from school, but he gets lost. He doesn't know where he is. He's out walking. He finds another young man and he says to him in simple Spanish, help me, I'm lost. And the person answers him and says, where are you going? Oh, I'm going to this hotel. Come with me, I'll take you. They start walking together. They, they meet three beautiful young ladies. This is a great story, okay? The young ladies come up to the, his new friend, give him hugs give him kisses, hold his hand, he says, oh, good to see you, good to see you. And then he introduces the young lady to his new friend, and they do the same with him. They give him hugs, they, they're very warm. Then the two boys go on their way, and the guide tells the narrator, don't worry about what happened. 
these girls I have known since I was a little boy. Two of them are my cousins. One of them is a friend. There's no romance going on. This is simply the way we are in Colombia. This is ordinary. In other words, what the author has done is to tell an interesting story and teach a little bit about culture. The whole book is like that sort of unusual incidents that are explained as normal parts of the culture. So you see, these books are getting more and more interesting. I've been reading a lot of them and I'm getting better and it's easy. I can now read authentic, real Spanish. It's a little more difficult, but when I get a good author, I can read it and make sense out of it, I skip a few words, etc. But I am basically improving. This is my talk today. This is my message. I could stop here and that would be enough. Okay. I'll repeat it all in more complicated language. Okay. We get better when we get input. We don't have to know every word. We don't have to speak. And that is my message. And books are a wonderful way of doing this stories. Let me start all over again <clears throat> and uh, say the same thing again in more technical language. Cheers. We say in Hebrew, Lachayim to life. In Amharic, the Tenachin to your health. Right. Anyway, <clears throat> the theory begins, our work begins with some important hypotheses. We think people have two ways of getting better in another language. <clears throat> Excuse me. We, you can acquire language, you can learn language, and they're very, very different. Acquisition is what we call the natural way. It happens subconsciously. While you're acquiring language, you don't know you're acquiring. You think you're reading a story, having a conversation. You are, but at the same time, you could be acquiring, okay? Uh, we call it picking up a language. I was in Mexico for a few weeks and I picked up some Spanish that really means you acquired it. Here's the big secret. We are very good at language acquisition. Human beings are all good in language acquisition. We are all gifted. We are all born to acquire language. It's easy and it works very well. We are not very good at the other process. That's language learning. Language learning is knowing about language. The subject and the verb are supposed to agree. This is how you make a relative clause. This is how you spell this word, knowing the rules. We are not very good at language learning. This has caused a great deal of suffering. Language learning is what the brain does very poorly. We're very good at language acquisition. Okay, second hypothesis. And this hypothesis kept me very busy for about 10 years, starting in about 1980 called the natural order hypothesis. And it says, we acquire the rules of language in a predictable order. Some rules come early, some in the middle, some are late. For example, for English as a second language and first language, the, the uh, progressive tense, John is playing the violin, that one is early. It's kind of strange, but it comes early. The third person singular, I go, you go, he goes, is late acquired. For first language, there could be a year between those two. For second language, the third person singular may never come. We all know people who speak English as a second language very, very well, but they make mistakes on the third person singular. I have to tell you about my old friend, Masayoshi Shibatani. When I was a professor of linguistics, Dr. Shibatani had the office next to mine across the hall. His specialty was Japanese linguistics and English grammar. He knew more about English grammar than anybody else in California, I'm sure. When I had a problem in English grammar, I asked Dr. Shibatani, okay? He knew, he knew all the rules, knew them very well, an expert on the syntax, okay? When he wrote, he got the third person singular right. When he spoke, sometimes he left it off. He 
had known that rule for 40 years when I met him. And he teaches it. He still made mistakes using it. It's late acquired. And here is here's some fascinating facts about the natural order, which explain why language teaching can be so difficult. Number one, you can't change the natural order. You can drill the third person singular all day, but it won't be acquired until we are ready for it. And you can't change that. Wow. Right. The order is not from simple to complex. Some things seem very easy. Third person singular seems very simple, but it's late acquired. The present progressive is a little complicated. That one is early. The order of acquisition is not the teaching order. It's not the syllabus. I thought it was. 1980, I gave a big speech in a convention in California. Huge audience, actually only 10 people came to my session and there were eight chairs, so standing room only, okay. Anyway, and I said, we now know the natural order. The linguists have told us we can teach along the natural order. We'll teach the progressive early, third person singular later. Wrong. I was completely wrong. Not for the first time, probably not for the last time. It turns out that is not true. The order is not the syllabus. If you do language teaching correctly, you will the natural order will be there as a result. Okay. Okay. Next one. The monitor hypothesis. This is a big one. This tells us about grammar. I have been misquoted about grammar. <clears throat> Let me set the record straight. People say, Krashen says, never teach grammar. Krashen says, teaching grammar is wrong. It is evil. Teach grammar, go to jail. No, this is not my position. My position says it's hard to teach grammar. It's not easy. There are several conditions that have to be met if you want to use grammar. We think we use grammar as what we call a monitor. While you're speaking or writing, you think you're gonna make a mistake, you think of the rules and you make the correction. That's how we, we, we use it, okay? This is very hard to do. Number one, you have to know the rule. We don't know all the rules. The best language, okay, our best students don't know the rules. The language teachers don't know all the rules. Linguists don't know all the rules. Noam Chomsky doesn't know all the rules. <laughs> Noam Chomsky knows more about English grammar than anyone else alive, than anyone who has ever lived. His method of working is to do careful analyses of English and his idea, which I think is right. If you get the right description, you will find the universals of language. I think it's a brilliant strategy. So he really knows a lot about English, no question. He doesn't know all the rules. He says, we have only described fragments of English and other languages. So we can't possibly use grammar because we don't know all the rules, not even close. And we may never, some of them are just too complicated. Now, if when are these conditions met? When are these conditions met? When you know the rule, you're thinking about correctness and you have time. These are the conditions. If you are speaking English right now and you want to apply a rule, you have to know the rule, you have to be thinking about the rule, and you need to have time. Very difficult. This doesn't happen very often, <clears throat> but it does happen when you take a grammar test. When you take a grammar test, you study the rule, you're thinking about correctness, and you have time. Our research back in the 1980s, even when the conditions are met, people don't use grammar very much. This has really helped me knowing about this, how difficult. Uh, one of my colleagues I respect a great deal is a polyglot named Steve Kaufman. Steve Kaufman knows, I think, like 17 languages. And I have been with him when he's been using these languages. I have heard him speak Chinese. I have, he, we had lunch with my Chinese teacher once. I, I have heard him speak Spanish. I have heard him speak French. and He's really good, no question. 
And here's what he says. Don't worry about making mistakes. Nobody cares. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? I use that. He says, nobody wants to, nobody cares if you're perfect. They want to know what you're talking about, not how you're saying it. It's only a few grammar teachers who worry about your mistakes. So I go with Stephen Kaufman. I'll tell you a very interesting fact about Kaufman. This is off the subject. He speaks like 17 languages. He acquired six of them after age 62. Isn't wow. that wonderful? Yeah, that's Amazing. so encouraging. That's so amazing. I regard him as my language therapist. So the best thing to do is to simply speak the language. Don't worry about your mistakes. You get more input that way and you will improve faster. Okay. And now, how do we acquire language? The big moment. If we don't do it through grammar, how does it happen? Um, the ability to do grammar is the result of language acquisition not the cause, okay, very important. We acquire language in one way and only one way, when we understand it. We don't acquire language by speaking. We don't acquire language by learning the rules. When we understand what we hear and we understand what we read. That's why I told you the story. I'm getting better in Spanish, not from trying to talk to Fidel, okay? Fidel has introduced me to all his friends at the grocery store. It's so funny. He says, this person speaks all these languages. It's so interesting. He speaks Spanish, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, so they, people come up to me and ask me questions about how to learn languages. I am a celebrity at the local supermarket. Uh, you anyway. are a celebrity all over the world. <laughs> no, just in the supermarket, I'm, I'm sure. Anyway, um, here's what we think. It's not through production. It's not through study. In fact, trying to speak can be very painful if you're not ready. If we try to speak and we have learned the rules, but, we've, but we haven't acquired them, it's really, really tough and it makes us nervous and upset. It's time for me to tell you another wonderful story. And one of, this is one of my favorites because one of the heroes of the story is my daughter. She was like six years old at the time of the story. She's now 51. Can you imagine? Uh, she has children. Oh, it's wonderful. Anyway, um, she had a friend who lived on the street, and she would go play with the friend at the friend's house. And my task was to go to their house at a certain time, pick up my daughter and her friend, and bring them both to my house. Because our neighbor, we were quite good friends with these neighbors, I had to go, she had an errand at a certain time, say 10 o'clock. So I came over to pick up my daughter and her little friend so they could come over. And uh, my neighbor said, well, just a minute before you leave, I have to go in the kitchen and take my pill. Okay, now we were good friends. So I could ask her what was going on. She went in the kitchen, took this pill, drank water, felt better. I said, what was that? <laughs> She said it was Valium. Today it's called Prozac, anti-anxiety medication. <laughs> she said, I'm taking Prozac or Valium. And, you know, we were, again, good family friends. I said, why are you doing this? She said, I'm going to take my Spanish class. My Spanish class makes me very, very nervous. In English, the expression she used, my Spanish class freaks me out. That's so sad. What, is it, what is it about Spanish class that makes you so nervous when the teacher calls on me or I have to give a presentation and I'm not prepared speaking when I'm not prepared. Now that got me very interested. I looked at all the research I could find. It turns out that in class, what causes the most anxiety is speaking. Number one, so this is, and I wrote a paper about it, which you can find. Um, it's called uh, help, uh, okay, down with forced speech. Forced speech means having to talk before you're ready. I found many studies that said the same thing, that speaking in class provoked the most anxiety of anything, okay? And I found uh, not just research, but case histories. An anthropologist 
named Sorensen uh, visited the Amazon Valley in South America. And he found a small area where there were like 10,000 people. Now, 10,000 is not very many. If you go to a soccer match, a football match, and there are 10,000 people watching, that's not a big deal. That's nothing. You know, the World Cup, you can get 100,000, okay? In this area, 10,000 people, they spoke 24 different languages. Wow. And they had a very interesting rule. You cannot marry someone who speaks your language. You must marry someone who does not speak your language. So, <clears throat> Yeah, I, I violated that. My wife speaks English. What can I do? Okay, it's too late now. Okay. Uh, so in this group, there, there's language acquisition all the time. The children have to learn mommy's language, daddy's language, the language of the local group, the language of the wider group, what we call the lingua franca, the language of the entire group, their entire lives they are acquiring more languages. Sorensen, a very good anthropologist, got very interested, wanted to know how they did it. They began by listening, not by talking, just listening. It might take them a year before they really started talking so they could get used to it, okay? Now we can go a lot faster in our classes because we can give people comprehensible language right away not true now, but we find this true. And they wait, another uh, uh, observer said, we wait until we can hear the language, start to understand it. And then we might start talking a little bit at a time, but we don't force it. We don't talk until it comes easily, okay? Like a child. So, pardon? Like, like a child, as a child learns the language. Exactly, a silent period, exactly the way children do it same idea the natural process so this is how it happens now if this is going to work some conditions need to be met the input has to be interesting that was a big discovery we have ignored this in language teaching you know this i know this many language classes are boring okay they have to be not just interesting but very interesting the word i like is compelling so interesting you forget that you're listening to another language that's what we're looking for in our language classes so we'll we'll come back to that another important po point language acquisition is gradual it happens slowly not all at once the research from the university of illinois i greatly admire the illinois researchers i've learned a great deal from them this they've done in first language and it's been shown to be in second language each time you hear a new word <clears throat> or you see a new word and you understand it but it's new you get a little piece of it you don't get the whole thing right away language class we assume once you get it all it takes you know 5 10 15 20 repetitions in different contexts until you start to acquire it it happens a little bit at a time. Gradually, you build up the entire meaning by hearing it, reading it again and again. You get about 5 10% of the meaning each time you see it. How does this happen? Context. Little, I'll give a definition, okay. But the main way is context. Context is not very popular in language teaching. We like to deliberately teach words, and that's not wrong, it's okay. But the way we get it is, is through listening and reading through context. Here's the argument against context. They say, well, if you see a word in print and you hear someone use it, it may not be the right, you may get the wrong idea. They use this example a lot. Show a picture of someone pointing, and there's a word underneath. Now, could that mean hand? It could mean finger. It could mean over there. It could mean wrist. But that's not a problem. Most contexts are helpful. A beautiful study was done years ago in first language. They found that 60% um, of words you see in a, in, in a print are helpful. The context is helpful. 
about uh, 30 percent doesn't matter one way or the other only eight percent push you in the wrong direction so if you keep listening you keep reading eventually you absorb you acquire the full meaning this is very very cheerful i think very good information it has to be it has to be uh we all all of us listening to this uh, even someone who's just an intermediate acquirer of english will know thousands of words probably know ten thousand words that's not ten thousand trips to the dictionary that's not ten thousand draw a line from the word to the definition it's context that does it it's the only way it can possibly happen and we all most of us know fifty thousand hundred thousand words those of you who are bilingual most of you two hundred thousand you are the champions let me tell you okay so it can't be one word at a time let me now talk about application and i'd like to begin this important discussion <clears throat> by telling you another story i live in southern california i would say about 40 kilometers from los angeles now uh, the city that's the closest to santa monica and until the pandemic, I would drive to Santa Monica or Venice, California, twice a week at least, sometimes three times a week. It's about, you know, a 30 minute, 40 minute ride. It is boring. I hate driving cars. I just hate it. My wife drives usually when we're together, I, much better. She's a better driver than I am anyway, okay? So what do you do when you're in the car alone for 30 minutes? twice a day well you listen to music right well what they've done is they've put all the music on stations you have to pay for all the good music they know what they're doing so i don't do that anymore then there's the news and the news is so depressing i don't want to hear any more about donald trump i'm sorry because that's it that's all you get okay uh and of course, the pandemic and how many people are sick. And, oh, gosh. Uh, so I don't listen to the news anymore. What I started to do, though, I stopped the local libraries. I enjoyed stopping at the Santa Monica Library because that's where my daughter worked and I could go see her. OK. And I started taking out recorded stories, audiobooks, books on discs. And I started listening to them in the car. Very interesting. Now, what did they have in the libraries? I joined two libraries so I could get lots of books for free. Not, oh, they were all in English, nothing in other languages. So I couldn't do my linguistic thing. No classics. I'm a college professor. I should listen to George Bernard Shaw, Shakespeare. No. Bestsellers, only bestsellers. I started listening to bestsellers. I listened to legal novels, John Grisham. I started listening to medical novels, romance novels, uh, historical novels, detective stories. Guess what? They're pretty good. I was really surprised at not everyone, but a lot of them were really good. Fiction writers are very sharp people, very intelligent people, very clever. The first one I listened to, you know what it was, Harry Potter, of course. I have now listened to all seven Harry Potters. They're wonderful. You know this already, especially for us. We're educators, and they're all about Hogwarts and school. And the, the headmaster, Dumbledore, is the hero of some of them. A school administrator is a hero. <clears throat> the teachers as heroes, the good teachers, the bad teachers, what goes on. And Harry and his relationship with his friends, Hermione. Hermione's very interesting. A student of mine, uh, Hermione, as some of you know, was the super student who always raised her hand and knew the answer. Um, a, a student of mine wrote a very good paper. Is Hermione smart? Is that real intelligence? very insightful so this harry potter is perfect for us i loved it i listened to hunger games wow hunger games is all about politics it's all about rewards it's all about education what we do is we give prizes to some schools but not others that's what happens in hunger games 
we compete. We shouldn't be doing that in education. All schools should have lots of funding, of course. Okay. So these are excellent. They make you think. So I began to understand these books. Uh, let me tell you now what the research says a little bit about this and why I'm so interested. First, my hypothesis. The most important word for application of this theory, stories. A synonym for stories, literature. That's what we're interested in. Literature is the way we do it. Another synonym, fiction. Fiction is, I think, the main answer. When people take books out of the library, most of what they take out is fiction. I will share with you some new data nobody else knows. I shouldn't tell this to you, but I'm analyzing some data from China about children reading in Chinese what they take out of the library, 90% fiction. <laughs> Everywhere, people love stories. Children like stories. Children love it when mommy and daddy tell them stories. Uh, uh, one study found 90% of children said they like to hear stories. The 10% who said they don't, mommy and daddy didn't like to tell stories. Now, you parents, you know about this. You like, I love telling stories to my children and now my grandchildren, well, they're getting a little old for it now. I'll wait for their children, okay? And there's nothing like it. It's fantastic, it's pleasurable, and this is how we learn. They get a great deal from them, from them, exactly. Well, we know also that the more stories you hear and you read, the better off you are. The best language teaching methods today Real second language, foreign language, rely on stories. I'll tell you about one method done by my colleague, Benico Mason. She was teaching English. She's now retired. She's teaching, she's teaching English as a foreign language at a university in Japan, as well as being a professor and doing research. Um, she invented this kind of method for her beginning students. They're really advanced beginners. They're college students. The class was stories. That was the whole class. You go to English class and every class period, you hear more stories. What a wonderful way to spend the day in English class. She used Grimm's fairy tales, tales that she says have stood the test of time. We know are interesting. What she does is prepare the stories, reads it herself, and in advance knows the words that students may have trouble with when she tells the story. As she tells the story, she first introduces it and says what it's about. And when there's a word that might give the students a little trouble, she draws a picture and writes the word underneath. Here's the story about a man and a woman. Okay, man, M-A-N, um, et cetera, it looks like a man, et cetera, that kind of thing. And as it gets more complicated, the pictures get more complicated. If, or she'll explain using English, using other words, if she must, she will give a quick translation in Japanese, okay? And that's another tool that she uses, all right? Here's what she has found. She gives, for as part of an experiment we did a long time ago, she then, after she tells the story, she will give them a quiz. This is the experiment, maybe two weeks later on some of the words. She compared that to what happens when you give them extra exercises. Oh, let's combine the two. Let's tell a story and then let's do vocabulary building activities. Draw a line from the word to the definition, write three sentences. Here's what she found. In terms of words acquired per minute, the stories were more efficient. You gain more vocabulary listening to a story than doing an exercise. My former student, Jeff McQuillan, found the same thing, looking at lots of studies. You get much more from reading than you do from doing vocabulary building exercises. So if we want to be efficient, telling stories is actually faster. Don't do the exercises. Tell another story. People say, oh, no, no, we have to, you know, what if, what if the word doesn't come back? What if they don't hear it again? Uh, we have to make sure we use the frequent words. 
you know, if a word is frequent, it's going to come back. <laughs> That's what frequent means. Right. <laughs> you can't help it, okay? So keep telling stories, the word will come back again and again. Trust input, it does work, okay? Yes. We also found that fiction is better than nonfiction. Oh my. A study done in the UK, in the University of London, uh, they compared, they looked at people who were uh, in their 40s and gave them a test of English vocabulary, native speakers. This is one of many, many, many studies. Uh, they gave them a test of English vocabulary and then a questionnaire. Do you read? What do you read? Et the best predictor of English vocabulary was pleasure reading. And reading fiction was a stronger predictor than nonfiction. Wow. The best way is fiction, lots of it. This was, I first got the germ of this idea, stopping at the local library and listening to stories in the car, okay? So this was part of the research. And we all know getting a good storybook is so pleasant, okay? turns out it's good for vocabulary. It's not only good for vocabulary, <clears throat> the studies also show it's good for spelling. People who read more spell better. Okay, a little bit of gossip. Um, in the Washington Post a few years ago, there were several letters complaining about Donald Trump and his spelling. Donald Trump does a lot of Twitter, a lot of tweeting, at least he did. And he made lots of spelling mistakes. <clears throat> and people wrote in complaining, he's the president, come on, he shouldn't make spelling mistakes. And people defended him. No, it's okay, you know, spelling mistakes are all right. We elected a commander in chief, not a speller in chief. He just needs a good dictionary, et cetera. Let's not worry about spelling. I wrote a letter to the editor, which was published in the Washington Post, it was so exciting. And I said, we have to worry about spelling. We know, my own research says, spelling is influenced by reading. People who read more spell better. We know that Donald Trump doesn't read very much. He's bragged about it, okay? This is how you become a better reader. Not only that, you get larger vocabulary. Not only that, you write better. And he's not good at any of these things. The second point, people who read more no more. And basically from reading fiction, they know more about history. They know more about literature. They know more about science. People who read fiction know more about everything. They know more about geography, politics. Donald Trump doesn't read fiction. He is always making mistakes in public and it's very embarrassing, okay? He was once in Egypt and his uh, colleagues there took him to the airport. <clears throat> he was supposed to get on an airplane and fly to Israel. And he told one of the people, he says, well, I'm off. No, no, I'm sorry, he was in Israel and he was gonna fly to Egypt. And he told his friends, I'm off to the Middle East. And his friend said, you know, you're there already. <laughs> Israel is part of the Middle East. He didn't know that. He had no idea where he was. This comes from reading. Most of what people read is fiction and the knowledge is there. I had a wonderful example of this. Um, about 20 years ago, I was told I have to be on a jury. You, this is rotated, they, you know, if you're voting, you have to be on a jury. And I showed up for the jury and because I'm a college professor, I was, I was made the foreman of the jury, the head of the jury in charge of it. Oh, it wasn't easy, let me tell you. I don't think I did a good job. I really don't. I was, I had a lot of problems. A couple of years later, I read a novel called The Runaway Jury by John Grisham. If I had read that novel before I was foreman of the jury, I would have done a much better job. Justice would have been served, okay? Because I didn't know enough the novels tell you about these things, about what goes on in life, experiences you can't possibly have. So books, reading gives you language. And I put that in my letter to the editor. 
and it gives you knowledge about a lot of things. Not only that, knowledge gives you what they call habits of mind. I saw this in an article in the magazine Scientific American. People who read more understand other people more. They have more empathy. They begin to understand what goes on in other people's minds. When you read a novel, you live the experiences of many, many other people. I was thinking of that when I listened to Murder on the Orient Express, Agatha Christie, listened to it in the car. So many people, so many different ideas, so many different philosophies of life. You can't find that by yourself. Novels give you that, okay? Here is, uh, they also give you empathy, understanding what other people are like, um, etc. cetera. Uh, they also tell you, this is what the research says, the world is complicated. Simple solutions don't work very well. Again, back to Donald Trump. He decided what we should do about China, the United States, we should have a tariff. We should charge them for goods from China. It didn't work, it was a terrible idea. It messed up both countries because he didn't understand how it worked, okay? Reading helps you through that. I want to quote someone now who's the complete opposite of Donald Trump, and that's former President Barack Obama. Barack Obama did not read all this research, <clears throat> but he's very well read, and he's a graduate lawyer and a very sophisticated person. Here's what he said. The, the uh, British magazine uh, newspaper uh, asked him about his reading habits and what he read and how it's helped. Here's what he says. When I think about how I understand my role as citizen, the important stuff I've learned, I think I've learned from novels. It has to do with empathy. It has to do with being comfortable with the notion the world is complicated and full of grays, but there's still truth to be found. It's possible to connect with someone even though they're very different from you. This is what the research says. Noam Chomsky says the same thing. He said, we'll probably learn more about human nature from reading novels than from reading research in psychology. Wow, this keeps, this is a gift that keeps giving. Now, important, if we're going to do this, we have to make sure there are books for our students to read, lots of them. I'm lucky, I know how to use the internet, I know how to get to libraries, et cetera. We have to make sure there is access to books. Uh, let me tell you about my hero in this area. My hero is an American researcher on libraries. His name is Keith Curry Lance, L-A-N-C-E. Here's what he has found about the American situation. Schools in the United States with better libraries, that means more books, and the presence of a certified credential librarian, those students read better they have higher scores on reading tests. Libraries are the key to this. In Benico Mason's uh, class that she taught at the local university, she had access to a library of 5,000 graded readers. The Longman series, the Newberry series, this is where we need to spend our money. Make sure our students have access to lots and lots of books. So simple. And it's the last thing we ever think about. I want to make one more point before I open things up for questions. And that is the value of students selecting their own books. And then I want to say a word about academic language. Uh, Self-selection, extremely important. Uh, you got to choose it yourself. I'll tell you my experience, which is the same as yours. When I was in secondary school, I took English class. You know, required, okay. We read British literature, we read English literature, the teacher assigned the classics. Then we read the books and we wrote reports and we took tests. I passed all the tests. I don't remember a single book that I read in any of those classes, not one. I'm sure I read something by Shakespeare, but I don't remember which one, okay? It was complete waste. I remember all the books I read myself that I selected. Those days I read science fiction. I read all the books by Isaac Asimov, Arthur C. Clarke, Robert Heinlein. I remember all of them. 
I remember the plots and they had a profound influence on me. I read books about baseball. I read baseball sports books. They were brilliant, absolutely brilliant because they were psychological analyses of the players, how to be a good person, um, et cetera. This is the reading that influenced us, the reading that we decided we read. The good evidence for this is what happens when someone gives you a book as a gift. Here's a, I hate that, when someone gives me a book as a gift. Here's a wonderful statement by an American humorist, Garrison Keillor, I love this. He says, when I was in college, I was an English major. <clears throat> so of course, people always gave me literature as gifts, okay? Over the years, I've gotten Dickens, Thackeray, Smollett, Richardson, Emerson, Keats, Boswell, and the Brontes, all of them great, capital G. None of them read by me, okay? All of them on my shelf, looking at me, making me feel guilty. And what I'm afraid of is someone coming up to me and saying, Steve, how did you like that book I gave you? And I haven't read it because it wasn't what I wanted to read now, okay? Now there are exceptions. Uh, there's one person, when he recommends a book, I read it immediately, I drop everything because he understands me better than I understand myself. That is my son. He knows what I should be reading and he always has the right to say, here, dad, try this. Okay, yeah, and it was perfect, okay. Uh, and technical books, trade books, uh, my colleagues will often recommend, and the, it's a very good thing to pay attention to what they say, because they know things about research I don't. Sometimes we go back and forth. But in terms of fiction, I like to choose it myself. I have a Garrison Keillor shelf in my office, and I see those books. I don't know what to do with them. I, I usually give them to libraries, but I cover up the part where it says, to Steve, hope you enjoy this book. Okay, so no one will will figure out. So self selection is the crucial point. Now people will say to this, and this is my last point before we uh, go to the questions. Well, reading is these novels and this fiction that you're talking about. That's okay for everyday language. But what about technical language? Don't we need special academic language? As everybody knows. This is a multi-trillion dollar industry, English for academic purposes. I'm very sorry. I'm about to destroy that industry. I, I, I can't help it. I have to do things that the research is telling me to do, okay? I can make a lot more money writing a book on academic vocabulary and give exercises, but that's not, that's not it. Uh, there have been analyses my colleague, former student, and now my colleague, Jeff McQuillan, has done some really nice analyses. He looked, for example, at the seven Harry Potter novels. If you read seven Harry Potter novels, you will acquire about 200 academic words, words that are on the official list of academic words, and they appear enough time so you can acquire them. Now, McQuillan did another study of young people's novels. He looked at 22 novels, brilliant. He looked at Nancy Drew, Twilight, all the, all the academic words are there, or most of them, and they come back again and again and again. They are there. This is a good place of getting academic knowledge and a lot of academic words. A wonderful study, Rolls and Rogers, looked at science fiction, science fiction contains nearly all the academic language you need for all areas of science. Isn't that wonderful? Okay, let me turn this now over to questions. Uh, what happens? I ask questions. No, you ask the questions and I give the answers. Well, we already have a list of questions that have come up. And let me begin with the two questions I think are really, really important, big ones, okay? All right, so go ahead. Okay, Dr. Krashen, you've been doing this for a long time. You've been doing this research now for 45 years on comprehensible input. And the research is overwhelming. We know it's true. It's replicated again and again and again. In fact, we're tired of it. Why aren't we all doing it? And that's true. We're not all doing it. 
I look at catalogs of lo the local community college. I looked at their catalog, their French class, German class, ESL classes. It's all traditional. You know, we'll study the irregular verbs. We'll do this and all that. No, they're not doing it. A few people here and there are, but they're not doing it. There are, I'm going to list the reasons, and I have a very simple solution that will save all of us time and money, okay, instead of wasting it. Number one, where is the research of Dr. Krashen and all my colleagues who did these wonderful studies? Uh, it's hard to find. It's in academic journals and in academic textbooks. The journals have two things wrong and the textbooks. Number one, they're impossible to understand. It's not you, I have the same problem. Th these articles are written by people uh, who have swallowed a dictionary and they can't help or a thesaurus and they can't help but use long words and sentences and you have no idea what they're talking about. They're trying to impress rather than give you knowledge. So that's problem number one. I find them difficult, okay? And I've read more academic journals probably than anyone else on the planet, okay? Yeah, I have a hard time. That's number one. Number two, they're expensive. If you read a journal paper or you see a title of a journal paper and you want to order a copy from the publisher, it costs 40 American dollars. The author doesn't get the money. The publisher gets the money. And you can't subscribe to these journals. They cost too much. Journals now are 100 American dollars, 200 American dollars a year. I don't know anyone who can afford this, including me. Nobody can. The only people who can look at these things and actually read them are currently college professors, university professors at big universities with first class libraries that give you privileges that will make copies for you. I'm retired. I can't do that anymore. I cannot afford to keep up with the literature. No way. If we don't do something about it, it is the end of this field of research. I have a solution. I'll give you two magic words. Open access. Open access. This was begun by a British mathematician, worked in algebraic geometry, still working. His name is Timothy Gowers, G-O-W-E-R-S. Timothy Gowers got angry at the mathematics journals. <laughs> For the same reasons. And he says no more. He started making all his articles available for free and started a place on the internet where you could find other people's articles. Here is the new look. Number one, open access. That's the new look. All of my papers are open access. You can get them for free. Everything I've written in the last six, seven years. If you go to my website, sdcrashen.com, you can find my articles. You can download them. You can give them away as gifts. It's oh my, And many of my books, nobody can afford the books. So this is what we must do. Don't worry, you, you're, nobody's gonna buy your book anyway because nobody can afford it. You might as well make it available for free. I'm doing that. People I've talked to about today, Jeff McQuillan has been doing that. He calls himself Backseat Linguist. You can find his blog easily on the internet. Uh, Shana Ashtari has been doing that research in heritage language and, and uh, accent. Uh, many of my colleagues, uh, Lucy Tse is doing this. This is what the field will now become articles that are open access. So number one, the solution, open access. Mine are, on, uh, they're on my, also I put them on ResearchGate and put them on Twitter. Number two, make them short. Someone once says, if you want to know the time, you don't want a history of the wristwatch. And that's what our colleagues do all the time. At give the point of the article and then leave. Here's the way articles should be, okay? A very short introduction. If you need a long introduction, you shouldn't be reading the article, okay? clear statistics and a short conclusion. Summarize it, make a few suggestions, and that's all. Do not publish your dissertation as a journal paper. 
No, I started to read. I'm telling you this because it happens to you. I start to read a paper and I'm up to page 12 before I know what the paper's about. Forget it. I have been reviewing papers for the last 40 years. I'm asked to review papers for journals, and I'm happy to do that. It's an important, important responsibility. So I don't mind doing this. Five years ago, I made a new rule. <clears throat> I will only review papers that are five pages or less. I have not reviewed any papers in the last five years because they're, they're all too long. I send them back immediately, make this shorter, and I'll be happy to read it. Some of the best papers. Oh, I sent away for this article. I got it from Nature. They were offering it for free. It was by Crick and Watson, the inventor of the double helix, you know, the DNA molecule. It's three pages. It's totally comprehensible. If you remember anything from secondary school biology class, you can pretty much understand it and it presents new data. The conclusion is the uh, implications was in one sentence. We have noticed that this idea might be helpful for that idea. No, that's all. That's all you need. Okay. So we must, we can change all of this by making things open access, short and clear writing, no more jargon. Um, politician wrote a great piece on this. He said, some people write articles that are very complicated, so no one will know what they're talking about. That means they can make, they can say the craziest things and no one will know, no one will criticize them. You won't be criticized if nobody understands you, okay? So this is a way of looking good. See all my publications and there you are, you get credit, promotion, um, et cetera. Okay, let me um, turn the floor over and see if there are other questions that you Hi. have. Right. So uh, first uh, I have a personal question, uh, like a kind of summary that uh, the, all the presentation which you like talked about. So uh, the main point we can say, and correct me if I'm wrong, for accus uh, accusation uh, of any language, uh, we must have input, which is according to you, compelling, which is interesting for us. And uh, the best way we can find compelling or interesting um, input for our acquisition process is through stories and especially through nonfiction. And yes, sir. And sir, uh, I have a question. Like uh, in uh, current times, uh, not many people uh, like read the novels or books. So, uh, but they do watch movies and uh, series. So uh, many of uh, non-native, like in my friend circle and I personally, like we understand language, uh, English language, but in movies or in some like videos, we turn on the subtitles. Subtitles are like the person are speaking, people are speaking and there is line under which is written. So it's like kind of reading and listening and watching them in action together, like with a full context, you can say. So would it also work uh, as novels and stories, the movies? Yes, I think subtitles do work. It's comprehensible input, no question. And movies today are, in my opinion, brilliant. The, my goodness, uh, the movies are just fabulous. So they do keep your interest. They're compelling. Soap operas, drama on TV. If you want good soap operas, watch Korean soap operas. They are, um, I usually like movies and TV shows that have lots of violence. I'm, I'm a real man, right? Mm -hmm. Blowing things up, car accidents, lots of karate and all that. And the Korean soap operas are about daily life, people, relation, and they're wonderful. So this is true. Movies are brilliant. The best minds are making these. The advantage of books is that there's more language. With subtitles, you don't get all that much. I'm not against it. Go do it. Fine. You will, you'll make some progress, no question. And it's so pleasant. I would also look for easier reading. Magazines comic books comic book yes with pictures comic books comic books comic books you are talking to stephen krashen the number one expert in the world on research in comic books the reason i'm the number one researcher is that i think i'm the only one that's why i'm number one 
Oh my goodness, they are, they are so good. Spider-Man changed the world. Comic books today, like uh, graded readers, are true literature. Uh, this was changed by Marvel Comics in the United States when they had superheroes with problems, real problems, real adventures. So I would, I would count those two magazines, all those so-called light literature counts as comprehensible input. So yes, it doesn't have to be a big, thick, heavy novel that you have to carry around. It can be a light novel. Uh, it can be a magazine. It can be manga. It can be comic books. All those things count. So do it and tell us about it when you've done it. Very well. So uh, now we will uh, come up with the questions which uh, the participants who registered like asked before the uh, webinar. And I'm sure that a lot of questions which I personally read uh, are already answered through uh, the presentation which you gave. So now the questions which I selected, the first uh, is by, uh, and sorry if I uh, pronounce some of them wrong. So uh, it's NOSISI, N-O-S-I-S-I. -I. Uh, what implications does language acquisition have on brain development? On what? Brain development. What? Brain development. Yes. Brain development. Oh my. Uh, without language, the brain will not develop. We know that. <clears throat> we know the left hemisphere grows when you get input. If you don't get input, language will the language acquisition device will shut off. We had a case like this years ago, a child who was isolated, treated poorly. And she could not use the left side of the brain to acquire language. It had to be done on the right and wasn't done very well. So it's got to be there. Uh, so this is the nourishment of the brain. Is language? No question. So of course, the answer is an enthusiastic, positive, yes, capital Y, beneficial, 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 all kinds of language, all kinds of meaning. OK? So now the other question uh, is by Somia, S-O-U-M-I-A. Is grammar so important for learning and mastering L2? What are most important tips or strategies that adults can follow to master their second language? Is it a good idea to use first language in classroom in non-native speaking countries? OK, the role of the first language, that is an excellent question. The first language can hurt, the first language can help. If you, the misuse of the first language is say something in the language you're teaching, uh, say something in, in, in your home language, then the language you teach, translate, translate, translate. So for example, if I'm teaching you German and I begin by saying, a guten Tag, wie geht das Ihnen? Good morning, how are you? My name is Stefan, my name is Steven, and I translate as I'm going, that's not going to help you very much because you're going to listen to the English. You will not listen to the German. It is totally useless. It's called concurrent translation. And it's been shown again and again that that doesn't work. That means bilingual texts are not a good idea. One page is in English. One page is in your own language. <clears throat> you're, you'd be, if you're a linguist, you'll be comparing and getting excited to do the comparisons. But it won't help. You want it all in the second language. But the good parts. If you give a quick explanation in the first language, it will make the second language more comprehensible. If you give a little bit of background knowledge in the first language, like let's say you're gonna tell a story in English and the class are, let's say, Urdu speakers, okay? You give a quick explanation of the story in Urdu, who the characters are, then when you tell it, it's more comprehensible. So it can help, it can hurt. We are all, everyone listening to this has profited by your education in your first language. You can understand me because you're well educated in your first language. A good example is a former California governor, Arnold Schwarzenegger. I, must, I once met him lifting weights in Venice Beach in Cal. I'll give you the gossip first, okay? Ready for this? And you can tell anybody. Yes, this is uh, the real Arnold Schwarzenegger very nice guy very pleasant we would all be lifting weights on the beach and arnold would come you know 
to lift weights, he would lift weights with us and he would give us advice. And he was a true master. He knew everything about weightlifting. He said, well, try it this way. Can I help you with that? He was wonderful and a good guy. We all traded. When Arnold gave us advice, we all told each other, you know, what he said. So it was a good, good education. Anyway, <clears throat> how did Arnold do so well in English? His English is wonderful. He had a good education in German. He was a high school graduate in Austria. He took advanced courses in German. He spoke German all the time. He didn't avoid it. So when, and he took when he got to California, even though he had these classes, he took more of them. When he came to California, he took ESL classes. So he had a good knowledge of the first language, comprehensible input in the second. His knowledge of German made English more comprehensible. His good education was very important. So good question once again. All right, thank you. And we will move towards another question. So it's from Stefania, S-T-E-F-A-N-I-A. So are there new trends in language acquisition in relation to technology mediated environment? Yes and no. I think, you know, there, we're doing technology sometimes for the sake of technology, and sometimes it's not necessary. Here's the simple answer. It works when it makes input more comprehensible. It doesn't work if it flashes on the word, gives you a quick definition, all this, but if it gives you background knowledge and gives you visual input that makes things more comprehensible, yes, of course. People have been experimenting with virtual reality that may or may not work. Let's try it, let's see. Okay, time for more. So we will go towards the third, fourth, I guess. So it's from Adnan, ADNN. So how different languages actually cause you to think differently, as if each language is a channel can only flow in certain directions? Well, I am not an expert in this area, but I have an opinion anyway, of course. <laughs> and my opinion is far more similarity than differences even with different languages that are incredibly different, people are so similar. I think language can, at a low level, influence thought. The old example, you know, Eskimos are more sensitive to snow because there are 20 different ways of saying snow in their language. Yeah, okay. But these are small examples. More exciting is the similarities, the universals among language. We know language is acquired the same way all over the world. It's always comprehensible input, always. There's no other way it can happen. All right, very, very well answered. So now the next question is from Sidra Harun. Uh, is there any reason that parametric resetting takes place some languages in some languages, but for some other languages, this does not work? Would you repeat the question, please? Yes. Uh, is there any reason that parametric resetting takes place in some languages, but for some other languages, this does not work? I don't know. There's my good answer. Okay. <laughs> okay. We'd have to see the cases. We'd have to see the cases. Okay. Yeah, these are the questions I can't answer, I regard as research uh, avenues that should be explored. Yes, sure. So uh, we will skip this question and the is from Amna. She says, cross, uh, she just uh, wrote cross gender language differences. So she might be asking, uh, does this uh, influence the acquisition or what are the differences? She just wrote cross gender language differences. Again, I don't quite understand the question. Uh, cross gender, Cross gender language differences. She just wrote that. She might be asking oh, about gender language differences. Okay. Again, yes, but the similarities are much more powerful. Uh, yes, we have to be concerned about gender, gender bias, et cetera, which is always very, very strong. But in terms of the actual way language is acquired, no change. The brain is the brain is the brain. All right, so now the next question. 
so it's from uh, how to h o a d o how can trans languaging be justified in second language acquisition and heritage language maintenance okay trans languaging i i keep seeing this word i've been trying to understand it for the last 2 years and i'm not really sure my impression is that trans languaging is a package of the many ways the first language can be used uh, some ways good some ways bad for example simple translation is translanguaging which is not all that helpful using the first language as background knowledge powerful a short explanation in the first language this is the basis of bilingual education the basis of bilingual education is first teach first language then the second language is far more comprehensible Another use is code switching, which comes in two different forms. In one form, code switching is an act of virtuosity and bonding. So when I meet someone who, and we both speak the same languages, we sometimes code switch just to show we are members of the same group. When I'm with elderly Jewish people, which is now me and my friends, okay. <laughs> Um, I'm now an elderly Jewish man. How do you like that? Uh, I use a lot of Yiddish, which is my grandparents' language, really my heritage language, okay? And it feels wonderful. Um, I have this friend, the uh, in fact, the cantor at the synagogue. He's from Argentina, and his mother comes to visit. I have a hard time with Argentinian Spanish. It's very hard to understand. So I, I started by speaking my Mexican Spanish with her, which she understood. Then she would understand, and she would, would listen, and I couldn't understand. So we switched to Yiddish, the language of our grandparents, okay? It felt good, and still now we speak Spanish. We will put in Yiddish expressions. It's a form of bonding, and it feels good, okay? So this is a form of translanguaging that has an emotional advantage to it it feels good it feels nice etc and sometimes it helps make things much much more comprehensible i love it when i'm having a conversation with a friend of mine who's mexican american and they will throw in something in spanish which says see i have confidence in your spanish it's nice okay <laughs> good so now for other question so it's from James Dominic. So it says, what are your thoughts on contrastive interlanguage analysis? We used to think, good question, James, that we used to think this was very important. We, and when I took classes in school, studying to be a language teacher, we thought contrastive analysis was extremely important. You look to see where the languages partially overlap, and this predicts the mistakes. And this is true, it does. Okay, to some extent. Does it matter? No. Because the answer is not to do drills in that area, but to give more comprehensible input, and those mistakes will disappear. So it's become much less important these days. What's important is comprehensible input, not predicting every single mistake and doing special exercises. There's a natural order, and we can't avoid it. Those mistakes will go away in time when we're ready for them so now the other question is from magali m-a-g-a-l-i how are the zone of proximal development and metacognition connected how are the what how are zone of proximal development and metacognition connected well metacognition really means reflection on language and it means for us conscious knowledge it means knowing about language it means conscious learning what i have done in the last 45 years is reduce the importance of metacognition in terms of grammar now metacognition in terms of strategies yes knowing having the knowing for example that the word will come back that always happens having confidence that it will the most important metacognitive fact again from uh, 
uh, Steve Kaufman, understand that you're a human being and you were born to acquire language and it is natural and expect that you will be successful. This is a powerful metacognitive fact and has given me a lot of confidence and has relaxed me many, many times. That kind of metacognition is important. Metacognition, knowing that age is not a barrier, that an old person like me can make progress in another language quite well. Another metacognitive fact, there are really no individual differences in language acquisition. Nobody is gifted. We all have the same acquisition device, just like we all have the same digestive system. You can't say my liver is more gifted than yours. No, they all works the same. Very little individual variation. This definition of metacognition, not, not about the details of language, but about how language acquisition works, I think is very important. So thanks for asking. Thank you for answering. And the other question is from uh, Marjorie, M-A-R-J-O-R-I-E. So what could be the re result of long, long lockdowns to babies or toddlers language acquisition? Like in, in pandemic, when uh, we have lockdowns and we cannot go outside, what would uh, be the result? on the language well, acquisition okay, of toddlers. Well, great, we, we have to change strategies, alter them a little bit. Again, input does fine with pandemics. If I said you had to acquire language by speaking and getting corrected, we're in big trouble. The pandemic has ended language acquisition. But if I say we acquire language by listening and reading, we can do fine. I'm doing great in Spanish. I'm making good progress. Okay. And, you know, I'm trying other reading. I'm keeping up with French and German reading novels easily. That's how you do it. The pandemic is not a problem, not at all. And I guess what is happening gradually is that the offerings on computer are improving. And that I expect to happen as pandemics continue and more of us are staying home. So again, great question. The pandemic, I hate to say it, has been good for language acquisition. All right. So the last but not the least question uh, is from, uh, it's very long name, uh, spelling. Uh, she, she, I will just uh, like, uh, I draw the letters. So S-H-E-I-L-A-L-A-I-N-E. -L -A -L -A right. So she, uh, what are your thoughts about world Englishes? Uh, do you think it is possible to like uh, possible to have a, uh, have a standard assessment like that of uh, TOE, FL, TOEFL, or else for world Englishes? Okay. Well, I'm I'm actually really tired of talking about assessments. <laughs> okay, <laughs> they have been a big problem, <clears throat> but world English, yes. Let's talk about that. There is no question <clears throat> excuse me, that English has become the world's language. No question. And it's there are far and when you include second language speakers, oh my. In fact, most speakers of English speak English as a second language. And this has been wonderful for the world. It means Korea can talk to Pakistan. That's what without any problem at all. Now, for those of us who love to acquire language, it's been a bit of a problem because everywhere I go, people speak English to me, right? <laughs> but I'm willing to suffer and sacrifice. Uh, that's just my hobby. It's a wonderful thing that we all have this common, common language. Yes, we will have more and more standard assessments, but all the assessments are imperfect. And the best is how well you can do use the language in a certain task, of course. So I think the uh, world language of English, well, it's tragic that we are losing languages. And the biggest tragedy of this is the loss of heritage language, the loss of first languages everywhere. This is a casualty of world English. The pressure for English is so strong that immigrant families tell their children just to speak English. They only speak English to them. The heritage language is lost, which means 
you lose the knowledge and wisdom you get from the elders. You use the cognitive benefits of bilingualism. You know, bilinguals are smarter. You knew that, of course. And you miss the economic advantages because sometimes you can communicate with other people you couldn't ordinarily communicate with and you know, trade improves. So there are only advantages, no disadvantages to multiple languages, heritage languages. But in return, we get this wonderful way of speaking to each other, which is just great. So let's do both. Let's keep the heritage languages and let's enjoy English as the world language. Hi. So now uh, we have uh, three questions which were repetitive and almost asked by a lot of people. So first of those questions is uh, any advice for language teachers who teach online? Yeah, advice for teaching online. Comprehensible input. You knew I was going to say that. <laughs> Comprehensible input. That's your job. You have to be a little bit more clever in using the screen to make input comprehensible and making sure students understand you. But this is more of a benefit than a problem. The Zoom, the computer, what we're doing now has been absolutely fabulous. It's been wonderful. So we can, if I could turn on my computer every day and listen to a good story in several other languages, that would be wonderful. And this is happening gradually. This is the future, teaching language online, yes. So uh, the other question is uh, like, what research areas or topics would you suggest to new or young researchers to research upon? Good question. Here's the answer, complicated answer. Number one, we're all different. You've probably noticed that. We all find some things extremely interesting that other people don't. We all find some subjects interesting and easy. Things that we find natural and pleasurable, other people find mysterious. The goal in life is to find what we're good at and what we like and do more of it, not less. The world needs specialization. Otherwise, when a problem comes up, we can't solve it. We need people with many, many different talents. The same thing is true of research. You have to find a problem in research that speaks to you. Don't work on a problem that Steve Krashen thinks is important. Work on a problem that you think is interesting and exciting. Uh, Gloria Steinem, the writer, feminist, made a great statement. She says, when I'm writing, I never think I should be doing something else. Find a problem where that you want to work on that feels right and natural. That is my advice, not somebody else's idea, but your idea. Do that and we will all profit because what you're good at, other people aren't. I need your expertise, you need mine. All right, sir, that's very good advice. Like in, uh... Like we can also relate it to the way we acquire lang uh, language. Like you said, uh, it should be compelling the input. So for research, right. the topic should be compelling to you personally. Self-selected all the time. Yes. Our lives have to be self-selected. We're all different. Yes, sir. So uh, the last questions are uh, for this webinar is uh, that what uh, brought this uh, like interest or we can say what made made you com uh, compelled to this particular area of research that you did such an extensive research and like produced a lot of work upon these topics what is your journey uh here's what happened when i was growing up i lived in a linguistic desert it was only english that's all my grandparents spoke yiddish my parents understood and answered in english i didn't acquire yiddish until much later in life Okay, um, so I didn't, I didn't, wasn't exposed to bilingualism, multiculturalism, all that stuff. I studied French in school. I got a passing grade in French only by promising the teacher I would never study French again. He said he would give me a passing grade if I never studied French again at that school because it would be embarrassing to him because I was so terrible. Today, my French is okay. Okay. <laughs> Um, so I never liked languages. Then my mother, my mother has helped me in so many ways. 
my mother decided that what I should do is take a trip to Europe. So I did that like middle class kids do in the United States. She put me on a bicycle tour of Europe. I was like 18, 19 years old, my first year of college. We went to Europe, we, we met with say seven or eight young people our age and a leader who was much older, two years older. And we did, we bicycled down the Rhine Valley, down Europe. We started in England, went all the way down to France. And when we got to France, we, I'm sorry, it was to Switzerland. We got to Switzerland, we stayed at a youth hostel. A youth hostel was a hotel for young people who were traveling. The first night there was a big party at the youth hostel teenagers from all countries who were traveling. And it was a lot of fun. That's when I first heard all the other languages. I sat in a small group and there was this young man who spoke French to some kids, German to others, and English to us. I thought he was remarkable. I had never heard anybody do that so easily. That moment, I decided I was going to get interested in languages. I wanted to be like that kid. Okay. The next day, our group was scheduled to go hiking, which I never liked. So I stayed back and I bought a book on teach yourself French. Okay. And I learned to count to 10 in French that day. And when I finished that, the youth hostel, we were done. We had two weeks in Europe to do whatever we like. I went to France, went to Paris, and I enrolled in the Alliance Francaise, a French language school. And I took French classes for two weeks, which weren't too bad. And I met other people and began to speak French with them. When I came back to the United States the next semester, I took French, I took German, and that was the beginning. And it has only gotten more and more intense. I discovered that I love languages. When I hear another language, I want to acquire it. And it all started that day. Studying other languages, working on other languages have been a very important part of my development. Uh, English is my first language. German is second. I went back to Europe. I studied music in Vienna. That's another story. I did much better with German than with piano. Uh, after that was French, after that Spanish, after that, some Hebrew, after that, some Mandarin, you know, here and there, uh, Amharic, different languages, and it's never enough. But I'm different. We're all different. I love doing it, and it, the spark began, the flame was lit that night at that youth hostel party, and I owe it to that young man who is so friendly and so good with other languages. That's how it's begun, and it has never stopped. I went to the doctor yesterday with my wife. She had an appointment, just check up. And of course, the doctor is from Persia, Iran, and I couldn't help it. I greeted him in Farsi. I just couldn't help it. And he said the right thing back. You know, I did Salam Ashkan Jan. Jan is like Habibi in, in Farsi. Use it all the time with people. <clears throat> and it gave me a thrill and excitement. <clears throat> but I'm different. That's the point. I discovered my interest and it was languages. Okay, okay, Habibi, are we done? <clears throat> They're pretty much uh, done. Like your talk is so interesting, I must say. And it's so a pleasure to like hear you speaking that it could go on. So, but uh, right, time is money. So <laughs> we cannot- No, time is, time is coffee. That's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> yes, from now on, time is coffee. So it runs out. <laughs> so uh, anyway, we can make another session always, like we can make another copy. But so anyways, so it was a pleasure to have you. And thank you Great very pleasure much. Meeting you, talking with you. For... Thank you. You're a very good host. I appreciate it. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you very much. And it was a pleasure to have you. And like you told the stories, you took time to answer all the questions and also uh, told all of your research work about it and you have done an amazing job and i don't have enough words to thank you and how grateful i am for you joining me so thank you very much and uh,
I think that's all about it. My final word is a commercial message. Yes, sir, sure. Please check out the website, sdcrashen.com. The articles are for free. The books are free. Use them. Tell your friends. You may share it with anyone except Donald Trump, of course. Okay. Uh, and also, I am on Twitter. And please follow me on Twitter. I use Twitter, tell a few jokes, but mostly to give the latest news, what the research is saying, who's doing what. So Twitter and the website. Right. That would be very helpful. sdcrashen.com and your Twitter account. Twitter is sgrashen. Sgrashen. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, I'm a bit nervous here, so. <laughs> Pardon well, thank me. you for everything. Okay. We'll do it again sometime. Sure, sir. And uh, okay. do you want to like give a message uh, to people uh, like about life or about pandemic or any other thing? The only you... message is stay away from junk food, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and exercise three times a day, drink plenty of water. Coffee's good for you. Up to five or six cups a day. That's the latest research. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> yes. In your case, you can have tea. It's fine. <laughs> it's been a great pleasure. All right, sir. Thank you very much. Bye. Hello, everyone. So we are back live now, and I hope you had a wonderful time listening to Sir Stephen Gershon. And we regret that it was not live and we could not take your live questions. But the questions which we received in the registration forms were already a lot. And as we had to come from Zoom back to the YouTube, so pardon. And uh, anyways, uh, you guys are very uh, supportive and I can see your comments. And you guys are absolutely amazing. And I hope you like the webinar. And uh, I hope that uh, you got the answers which you asking, like a lot of uh, answer uh, questions which were asked uh, in the registration forms, and even I could see it in the comment sections uh, were included in some manner in the presentation or the talk. You can say the sir gave, and the questions which later on followed the recording. So the recording was not much older; it was just recorded a night before, like it's eight. Uh, uh, 8 a.m. in Pakistan, this is started, and the recording which you just saw was like recorded at 10 p.m. at night, like a day before the, in Pakistan time. So anyways, thank you for joining, and I would like to mention that this webinar uh, has also a collaborator uh, for this, especially for this webinar, and like this is organized by, of course, Linguistics and Pedagogy webinars. And I'm your host and the founder of Linguistics and Pedagogy Webinars. And my name is Avesh Rameman. And the collaborator uh, we have is uh, GLTS, Global Law Thinker Society. It is very uh, like motivating and really supportive and really good initiative taken by Ma'am Rahman Simita. She is uh, the president of that organization. And they basically work for youth, and it is a nonprofit organization. So you might like to check it out as well. And the certificates, which we will be giving you uh, shortly, uh, for the link for uh, receiving them will the certificates will also include the logo and the signature of the GLTS organization, and of course the signature and logo of uh, linguistics and pedagogy webinars. Thank you so much for joining in. So now. Uh, listen carefully uh, for the certificate process, right? So uh, for certificate process, let me uh, just. OK, so uh, I have. So now you can see uh, down here that it is saying that fill the feedback form link given in the comments. So uh, from the experience from previous webinars, I have seen that not many people can find the link easily in comment section. So if you are joined, if you are joined uh, in like YouTube live through some uh, other platform where you cannot see the live comments, 
then please uh, log in to YouTube from your mobile or from uh, Google Chrome and make sure you are signed into your account so you can see and comment and all those things in the live chat. So make sure of that, that you are joined through uh, either uh, from your mobile phone uh, in your uh, YouTube application or from Google Chrome directly to youtube.com. And if you are not directly uh, joined from the YouTube or the Google Chrome, you can go to it and then search on YouTube Linguistics and Pedagogy webinars and you will find this video. So anyways, with, without further ado, uh, we will move towards sharing the feedback form link and feedback form link will be shared in comment sections to people who fill the link who, who fill the form through the link uh, will get the certificates and make sure you write your email address directly in it there is no typo in the name correctly because those both would be used for preparing your certificates it's an automatic process you provide us information we will produce your certificates Anyway, now I will be sharing the link. And once you are done with filling the link, you can comment here on YouTube that you are done with uh, the form. And the people who uh, did not uh, fill the form will not be eligible for the certificates. So I have sent the link. I will be sending it again and again. You can see it in comment section and here is the link kindly fill it and come back and say if it runs smooth or if you are facing any problem we can manage that i will be uh, here with you for another 15 to 20 minutes and once you fill the form uh, comment here done and then you can leave the webinar that's all about the webinar and if you have some queries or questions from us like the organization then you can email us at linguistics and pedagogy webinars at gmail.com you can also contact us on facebook uh, the page name is linguistics and pedagogy webinars and uh, also you have our channel on youtube so i am posting a link in comment section in live comment section of youtube kindly check it out and fill the form and make sure you fill the right information in the form make sure you write the correct email on which you want to receive the certificate and the correct name and thank you again for your immense support so i am commenting the link for the form and let's see how many forms we have got so far so uh, we have got 109 112 126 responses uh, we are getting on our form i'm commenting the link again so please note it again whoever fills this form will be eligible to receive the certificate and whatever information you provide on the form will be included in your certificate. For example, there are two fields, name and email. The email which you will provide, we will send your form to that email. And the name which you write there, it will be copy pasted to your certificate. So make sure you write correct name, you write correct email. We have also enabled the option to edit your uh, feedback form so if you think you have made some mistake you can also edit it so and after this live stream ends uh, the certificate uh, the feedback form link for the certificate will also close so make sure you uh, do it quick and Thank you again for joining and staying with us. I know it's late for some people and it's too early for some people, but due to different time zones, we all had to compromise a little. I also woke up at 8 a.m. Sorry, I started the webinar at 8 a.m. and I woke up at around 7 a.m. 
so i know uh, for some people it's really early and i have commented the link again in live chat kindly find that and fill the form and in the form you can also write compliments for sir stephen kishan uh, i will forward them to sir stephen he can read it uh, with your name uh, and also uh, sir stephen kishan have given two websites stcreation.com and his twitter handle uh, screation so kindly go and follow sir kishan on twitter and also check out his website stcreation.com over there you can find all his books all his work totally free of cost and as far as this webinar's uh, summary is concerned sir stephen kishan was kind enough to uh, uh, provide uh, the uh, what we can say the minutes of the presentations uh, in uh, word form so those who fill the form uh, might also receive a copy of it and i will try to post that in uh, our linguistics and pedagogy group like if you go to linguistics and pedagogy webinars page facebook page i'm talking about you will also find a link to the group over there so if you join that group you will also find uh, the presentation materials uh, which sir stephen kreshan shared with me for you guys and i am posting i keep saying posting but i am uh, commenting uh, the feedback form link in chat kindly go there fill the form come back here write done and then you are all set and about uh, i will just show this question on the screen so regarding our, uh, am i going to send the e certificate site away uh, sorry it is not possible it will take a few days for you to get your certificate so uh, I, it might be a week or so because the number of people uh, who have filled the feedback form uh, is a lot and there is a limit on gmail to send uh, emails to people so that email process will be a bit slower uh, i know it's not very good to uh, receive let e certificates but uh, what could be done i will try to send it as quick as i can but it will take uh, depending upon the number of uh, certificates we have to prepare a week or so so your patience will will be really appreciated so and there is a question about uh, from ariana uh, could you please share the link for the group uh, see uh, uh, right now i don't have the group link but if you go to facebook and search linguistics and pedagogy webinars right you will find our page facebook page and when you go to the page you will find uh, our group like there is a, a little tab written group and when you click on that group you will find our linguistics and pedagogy group so you may join it thank you and thank you for filling the form and there is uh, another comment thank you please make the record of this uh, recording of this talk available again yes surely as, as soon as this uh, live session ends uh, its full recording will be available on youtube for you to watch it later thank you very much and thank you for your support i am commenting the feedback form link again done i'm getting a lot of comments saying done yes uh share the doctor uh, questions web page yes it's uh, actually a website it is like a uh, s d question.com simple as that and uh, he also have a twitter uh, so its uh, username is s question thank you very much 
see we have a comment she has joined uh, like it's very late at night and she is here learning so it's kind of very motivating it's said at the same time like uh, at night we don't want to like, do this but these are the chances which we get very rarely so kudos to you for joining and thank you very much so some people are asking about where is the link so link is in live comment section if you cannot see the live comment section please join in from uh, youtube application from your mobile or from google chrome it would help and then you can fill the form so in argentina it's 1:50 am thank you for joining thank you very much i can send a few classes for this webinar uh, to be honest uh, i also did so we are in this together if we don't edit is it okay already yes if you have uh, like uh, are you, if you are sure that uh, if you have double checked the form and you think it is uh, correct and you have written it uh, like the right way and you are confident about it there is no need to edit it again just one is enough yes i can understand uh like it was uh, not a suitable time for many but what could we do uh, i tried to manage it uh, as good as it was possible like said question is in california so uh, in california uh, the time right now would be uh, like around 9 pm so like here in pakistan from where i am live i joined the webinar it 8 am in the morning so that time for circulation would be 9 pm so like the world is globalized now but we cannot make uh the time equal for everybody so this is a problem i know so anyways thank you for joining and thank you for all the appreciation so i am um, sharing the link again and also uh, one more important thing uh, when you uh, are uh, filling the form uh, make sure that you are already logged into your google account one of your google account please uh, make sure of it greetings from philippines uh, have a good day you all and i would like to uh, like uh, all participants are equal and i am very thankful to all of them but i have observed that we have a lot of people from philippines here on linguistics and pedagogy webinars and uh, the audience the most audience is from philippines and thank you very much uh, for philippines people to join this webinar and you are awesome we are receiving greetings from mexico too greetings to you too thank you very much for joining i have posted uh, the com uh, i have commented the feedback form link again those who fill the feedback form link will only be eligible to receive the certificates and make sure you write the correct email the correct name everything it will be directly copy pasted to the uh, certificate so make sure you have written the right uh, capitalizations you have used the right capitalization rules and you have not used smileys emojis anything like that so make sure uh, you write it in the way that you want that you want to be presented on your certificate thank you very much so question is asked by zaira yasti yes you can leave sure you can leave uh, if you have filled the feedback form uh, you can sure leave and have your rest 
uh, I am here for people uh, who haven't filled the feedback form or in case if they are uh, facing some issue regarding feedback form. So I'm available here for a while for them to like successfully fill the forms and everything. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for correcting me. So Filipi uh, Filipinos, thank you very much for joining and supporting from the start. And also thank you for all other people. I'm sorry, I cannot, I might not pronounce this correct, the country name. So it's from Sandra, getting from. So I really feel that I should not mess it up. Like, thank you very much. Yes, very interesting question. And uh, I would like to inform uh, that I contacted both Sir Stephen Kershen and Sir Noam Chomsky. Sir Stephen Kershen agreed for the webinar and you all saw him here. Uh, but Sir Noam Chomsky, he is quite busy for a while. So he uh, excused and uh, uh, he said that he wishes to be in webinar, but he cannot due to some commitments which are already made and he is super busy for a long time and i might uh, also contact him again for the webinar if he agrees or if he doesn't it's all right it's uh, it's okay i will just post uh, the email uh, which sir noam chomsky sent uh, on the facebook so you can all see how he writes thank you very much we have uh, uh, still 329 people watching this webinar and uh, and we have responses, 910 responses on feedback form so far. So thank you to all people who have joined. Thank you very much. Thank you for all your compliments and thank you for joining in early morning at late night at different times thank you very much i really appreciate it and yes uh, i'm very thankful for all the people who shared it with their friends especially i saw most of teachers sharing it with their students and a lot of pages on facebook uh, like other than linguistics and pedagogy webinars who were sharing uh, this uh, webinar details and all of it and thank you very much for everyone who spread the word uh, so see uh, the form has four fields uh, first is your email uh, there are two uh, like uh, fields in which you have to write email okay so uh, in that you have to put your email it could be the same it could be different depending on you and then uh, there is another section, your name, write the name which you want on the certificate, right? With uh, every word correctly placed, with right spacing, with right capitalization, everything. All right. And uh, uh, then there is compliment uh, field uh, named as compliment for Sir Creation. So if you fill in uh, that, I will send them to Sir Creation for to read. And then there is a section which is optional, that is feedback for the host. Uh, which will be useful for me, Avisrada, and for the linguistics and pedagogy webinars in future. So that's about the form. It's very nice to see that people from Russia are also joining. Thank you very much, Mariana and all the people from Russia and other countries for joining. Yes, finger crossed, uh, hopefully it would be, uh, and we are also looking forward to it. Like it would be so great to have a webinar with Noam Chomsky, and I will try to make sure that it's like really live and uh, it happens on YouTube directly. So there are two ways, either Zoom or YouTube. Zoom is not like uh, good for a lot of people. Like if we have a large number of participants, it would be a disaster on Zoom. 
So therefore, we will have to use YouTube. And if Sir Noam Chomsky comes, I will try to make sure that he joins lives and also take up some live questions from comments. But I also uh, give a section of questions uh, like pre-webinar questions, uh, which I like give a list of to the speaker. So like those are also you can consider them live questions. These are your questions as well. So I just send them to it. So uh, I will end the transmission, uh, but a little later, if you have filled the feedback form, then then that's all. That's all. You can leave the transmission. You can go rest and uh, go with your day. Uh, I'm just here for the people like who might face some problem in the feedback form or something. So I'm sharing the link and here I will be here for a while. And let's see. So here is uh, again question from about uh, the certificate. Certificate will be sent you within a week or so. Uh, the process will be slow. I will be honest with you, but you will receive your certificates if you correctly fill your feedback form. All right. So, and we have also uh, a person, Naveen, from uh, in. Western uh, action use call it Palestine, Palestine, uh, Palestine. But uh, in Urdu, we have a word for it, Pal Palestine, Palestine. So uh, glad to see you uh, uh, here and uh, welcome. Uh, but it's time to say goodbye now, but like welcome uh, and thank you for joining. And it's too early, 5 a.m. and especially in winters. So thank you for joining. And thank you very much. Uh, I will try to join your webinars as well. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, uh, you uh, might like send the link or something or whatever the process is to our page, Linguistics and Pedagogy webinars, or you might send it to my Facebook account. And it is named Aves Raza Meman on Facebook. So you will know it's me uh, when and bio I have written founder and director at Linguist Pedagogy webinar. So you will know it's me. And I have also uh, email, like you can email us at on our organization's email that is linguistics and pedagogy webinars at gmail.com. Very simple. Thank you very much. And uh, this live uh, will be saved. Yes, this will be saved uh, as uh, soon as I like enter and broadcast. This will be available on YouTube. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, uh, I guess you are talking about so Stephen Creation. So his Twitter account is S S letter S question S question. It's his first uh, Twitter account, and uh, he also has a website where he's uh, giving free books and his articles. It is called sdcreation.com. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, we have also people from Thailand. Thank you for joining. Thank you very much. We have people from Vietnam watching very late. Thank you very much for joining. If you have filled the form, you guys are allowed to leave <laughs> for now. Uh, you may join us in the next webinar we are going to have. So make sure you uh, stay connected with our Facebook page, Linguistics and Pedagogy Webinars. So thank you very much. And we, we hope to like provide more beneficial things about linguistics and pedagogy and to all the people out there 
and i hope you will all benefit from this platform we together have created you and us thank you very much people from saudi arabia assalamu alaikum thank you for joining so what is your experience learning english uh, if it's for certification so he uh, he adds his language is l1 so it's his mother tongue uh, if it is asked from me so i personally uh, learned english i would say a lot of from movies hollywood movies and watching hbo when i grew up and from cartoons and still i watch a lot of movies with subtitles especially so the reading also becomes faster when you watch movies with subtitles so this was my experience uh, about learning english and in a school we definitely had uh, classes tests gram grammar tests so on grammars i used to score well but i i don't remember all the rules uh, so it's difficult for me but i can speak english so i think i have acquired it a lot from movies and listening and all that and like the rules haven't benefited me a lot so uh all right i will be posting sorry i keep saying posting i will be commenting uh, the feedback form link again uh, you can find it in comment section so we have still 200 people uh, watching this transmission so i would like to inform uh, them all that the webinar has ended its recording will be available on youtube after this live stream so thank you for joining and uh, you have to fill uh, the feedback form host link i'm giving in comment section in order to get the certificate and also thank you very much so i am getting a comment can you please uh, so kindly complete the sentence i am waiting can i watch is the certificate downloadable so see uh uh yes so uh yes it is downloadable Uh, but it uh, you cannot download it today like uh, you will provide uh, you will provide me uh, the information like your email your name in feedback form right when we get the information in feedback form we will start preparing certificate and the email which you have provided in feedback form we will be sending the pdf file of the certificate to you personally on your email thank you very much so uh, you can uh, contact him on twitter uh, like askation his it's his username and all the people uh, who are still watching i have a message for you <laughs> that if you have filled the form you can uh, you can uh, like uh, rest or whatever go with your day and it's totally fine if you have filled the form your certificate is secured i filled the form uh, from with yahoo mail account is it possible to download the certificate see uh, i'm not totally sure about yahoo account mail i recommend you to uh, log in from a gmail account but if uh, yahoo mail account worked you were like able to complete the form and you have received a confirmation email that your form has been received then it's fine you will receive your certificate by email but i recommend you filling it through your gmail account so uh noam chomsky i would love him to be with us in a live webinar i would really like that too but i have emailed him earlier he said he is busy 
for a while now so it would not be possible but i hope that someday it is possible for us to have a live webinar with him and thank you very much for joining and staying with us well uh, so in my opinion what is the english level in schools in pakistan well uh, it depends on school really and the people also like in schools uh, which are english medium in which teachers speak english and the students are like asked to keep speaking in english uh, they do well with english and uh, also uh, if you see in middle class level we are the like private schools small schools and uh, there uh, urdu and english both are like given importance so as compared to the english which uh, students from elite schools speak the english proficiency which uh, students have from private schools differs like uh, they are more proficient and they are a little less but there is exception uh, the person who works on his english uh, proficiency who uh, listens more who watches movies and all of that he can learn english and be proficient in it even though if he doesn't attend any elite school or something like that so yes the webinar is finished it is not finishing it has finished and i'm just here for any questions or something like if you have any problem with feedback form so i am here for that so is the group on whatsapp uh, sorry currently we don't have it on uh, whatsapp we just have it on facebook uh, its name is linguistics and pedagogy group and you can find it easily through our facebook page linguistics and pedagogy webinars that's the name of our page if you go there you can find our group link there as well so right so can so i am posting the feedback form link again we have got 1018 certificate uh, not certificates uh, the response is on the feedback form link so those people will be getting their certificates surely and uh, thank you all for participating we still have 159 people live so thank you very much and please keep in touch with our facebook page like uh, on facebook page we will give updates and we might uh just a minute right so uh, on our facebook page uh, its name is linguistic and pedagogy webinars on facebook so uh, we will uh, update you there about our future webinars and uh, we might also arrange uh, something for the participants who have joined late so all that information will be available on our facebook page and uh, on a screen you can see <clears throat> our uh, sorry linguistics and pedagogy webinars at gmail.com that's our email if you have any query if you have any suggestion if you want to ask something if you want some information uh, you can email us at here and we will respond to you and for the uh, facebook page i would say it's same as linguistics and pedagogy webinars with spaces of course on the facebook page thank you very much and if you have filled the feedback form uh, you can like and you are still watching after filling the feedback form it's okay you can watch it's your choice but like we are all done all set everything is finished i am just here if in case if you have any problem or with filling up the form so we have received uh, 1031 responses so far 
and and once again i will mention that uh the form will be closed uh, after a while like after the live video ends the form will also be closed so please uh, fill it as soon as possible so uh so the recorded file of this webinar would be of course published uh, on the youtube channel the channel through which you are watching right now this whole session will be again available on the same channel linguistics and pedagogy webinars on youtube you will find this uh, whole session again in the form of recording thank you very much thank you everyone for joining it means a lot that you people participate and like watch the webinar and learn and even uh, in this webinar where time was not available to all but you all managed to join somehow thank you very much uh see uh i would suggest you to uh, copy uh, that link like copy that link and if you have laptop or any other uh, mobile device uh go to that and then paste in that and make sure you are using google chrome for it and it will work hopefully thank you very much and goodbye goodbye to everyone hope to see you again in next webinar uh, thank you very much okay so so far so good we have received 1045 responses thank you very much everyone for joining see regarding the questions like i feel sorry if the questions were not answered but uh, the form registration form for this webinar had a field to write write the questions before the webinar so the registrations which we got on our registration form uh, i stopped that at 6666 people have registered and all of them asked a lot of questions so it's not possible uh, for us to like ask all those 6000 questions from such different question and he also would not be able to answer them all in a single session so that's why uh, we had to shortlist the questions and uh, i hope that a lot of questions might have been answered and uh, you can always uh, go to sdcreation.com there you will find sir questions books and articles and everything he shares over there you might also want to follow him on twitter his account is s creation he posts uh, new information about research and all these things well uh, if you uh, cannot fill it up even after that so make sure uh, you are logged into your google account like when you open the chrome on open chrome on laptop right see if you are logged into chrome with your google account and then try to fill the form yes sure uh, rules don't uh, make necessarily the best when it comes to user language. Sure, if you are uh, continuously thinking about the rules that I have to use this form and uh, noun, verb, and object like this, so it would be very difficult. And uh, once you are done with thinking about the rule and making a sentence in your head, the person in front you have, front of you, would be bored. Or if he is talking, he would have gone so far in this conversation so right uh, rules are don't make us best uh, what we need is um, comprehensible input and we should also give that to the person hearing us so the message is clear so thank you everyone for joining again
right again we have posted the link thank you very much for joining if you have filled the feedback form and if you don't have any problem regarding it you can uh, leave uh, this live session the webinar has ended we don't have uh, anything else to do here for now so i'm here if you have any problems or suggestions maybe but you are free to leave the webinar thank you very much and i am sharing the feedback form link and if you have any suggestions uh, any advice anything anything you like anything you dislike you can uh, mention it in uh, the feedback form right and make sure you get your compliments to circulation of course i will send um, those compliments to circulation so he will be receiving your compliments thank you very much and also uh, like the participants who ask questions we also get a chance to learn a lot from them as well so uh, thank you for giving out your questions and thank you for joining uh, this all session was possible because of you guys participating so thank you very much hope to see you all again in the next webinars and for that you need to be in touch with our facebook group where we update about the webinars and all the things so that facebook page name is linguistics and pedagogy webinars thank you very much okay so we have live viewers 122 right now and we have got 1064 responses so i will be here for another three minutes and then i will end this live broadcast thank you very much and make sure you fill the feedback form without any typos without any mistake so you receive your certificates well certificates will not be sent immediately you will have to wait for about a week or so it would it will be a slow process to be honest but you will get your certificate if you fill the right information in the feedback form thank you for this great session watching from philippines see i told a lot of filipinos are watching and a major part of our audience is from philippines so it's really great and we also have like almost 40 different countries from morocco algeria nigeria usa russia we saw egypt saudi arabia palestine Palestine, some would call it, and a lot of people from a lot of countries. It's really good to see all of you here. Thank you, thank you very much. And yes, uh, it will be available after the streaming. This whole recorded session will be available on YouTube. You can watch it anytime. Thank you very much and thank you thank you thank you so we have 107 participants left feedback form on feedback form we have 1080 responses so far uh 200 more than the number of attendants see uh the attendants who are supposed to come like the people who registered but of course there were different time zones so some might have problems or some might for some it might be too early or too late so they couldn't join but i was watching the number so when the webinar started and even till the last we had around 900 people so what happens is uh, sometimes there is internet connection problem or something so people keep uh, going out of live and then coming back out back out back so therefore the number is 
code and uh, i am i hope that you are not sharing the feedback form link with people who haven't joined or seen the webinar just for the sake of friendship so don't do that if people haven't filled the feedback form or if the people haven't joined the webinar don't send them the feedback form link it would be like a cheating to the people who have watched the webinar live and take their time so thank you very much so okay so this is about time so now i will be ending this live stream and thank you everyone for joining for watching the webinar and it was a pleasure to have you all and goodbye for now and good night to the people who are watching it late and good morning to people who are watching it too early and good afternoon and be safe uh, take care of yourselves and see you next week thank you very much